Good evening and welcome to the trial of the Chicago 7 Talkback, a signature event of Columbia Reunion 2021. This year's reunion is a fully virtual experience and includes many opportunities to hear prominent Columbia alumni share their knowledge, insights, and wisdom with the Columbia community. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mila Atmos, Columbia College Class of 1996 and executive producer and host of Future Hindsight, a civic engagement podcast. This evening, we'll discuss Mark Levine's contributions to the publication of the official transcript of the trial and its inspiration of the critically acclaimed film directed by Aaron Sorkin. We'll also explore the parallels of the themes of social injustice and use of political protests that occurred in the late 1960s and what has happened here in our country in the past year. Before we get started, please note that to participate in the Q&A tonight, please enter your question into the Q&A box on the bottom of your screen and be sure to include your graduation year. Your entry will only be visible to our facilitator, and if your question is selected, I'll be asking that on your behalf. Please submit your questions at any time throughout the conversation. For optimal viewing, please enter full screen mode. Now, without further delay, I'd like to introduce our featured speaker, Mark L. Levine. Mark is a lawyer and co-editor of The Trial of the Chicago 7, the official transcript. He has also done voter protection work in more than a dozen states. His, book, his books include The Complete Book of Bible Quotations, A Bartlett's of the Bible, Still in Print After 34 Years, and Negotiating a Book Contract, A Guide for Authors, Agents, and Lawyers. He's also a graduate of the Journalism School and NYU Law School. In 1968, the year of the Chicago demonstrations, he worked in New Hampshire and Wisconsin as a volunteer for Senator Eugene McCarthy's presidential primary campaign against President Lyndon Johnson. Please join me in giving a big welcome to Mark Levine. Thank you, Mila. So uh, I'm super excited to speak to you today, and I have some questions. Uh, I, I trust that basically everybody here has at least seen the movie and uh, also hopefully read the transcript, the official transcript, uh, which you published um, I guess in 1969 now. Now, or was it 1970? No, no, we, it was published right, it was actually published 11 days after the trial ended on February 20th. So we, we had the book in stores literally 11 days uh, after the trial ended. And it's not a full transcript, it's an edited transcript. Because reading the full transcript, it's, it was 22,304 pages, I think. And to read a full trans, I mean, we made a mistake actually in this 50th anniversary edition by using the official transcript as the subtitle because transcripts can be boring. Uh, but what we, what we did was we picked out <laughs> really the nuggets, <laughs> really the courtroom confrontations between uh, between Judge Hoffman and the defendants, between the judge and the lawyers, and uh, basically we try to get all the confrontations. It's really a collection of the outrageous outrageous colloquies, uh, and also, unfortunately, sometimes hysterically funny colloquies uh, from the trial transcript. Yes, so I read most of the transcript. I'll admit here, I didn't quite read everything, but I read uh, basically, I want to say, three quarters of it and the very end. Uh, and so, as you said, you edited it heavily because we can't all read 22,000 pages of transcripts, uh, and really it revealed so much about what really transpired. So why did you decide to publish essentially the raw transcript? I know you edited it, but you know, why did you do that as opposed to telling the story? Well, one, having gone to Columbia, one of my favorite books there was actually uh, Henry Steele Comage's Documents of American History. So primary sources are really important. No, we didn't need somebody else, especially me writing my own interpretation or anything else. We wanted to get it out right away we wanted to see what people, we wanted people to see exactly what was being said and happening there because we were outraged. We, there was not a lot of, remember, this was before 24 hour news channels, before the cable channels. I think there was one 24 hour uh, radio news station, WINS, which started a couple of years before that. So a lot of people didn't know what was going on. Uh, there was maybe a minute on TV, uh, but my friends and I, we, we had been reading the articles in the New York Times by a reporter named Anthony Lucas. And we couldn't believe what we were reading. 
about what was happening. I mean, I, I guess I was 25 at the time. I had just graduated law school the previous June. The trial began September 26th in 1969. And what we were reading was unbelievable. Just could not believe it. Uh, and actually, it's very interesting. We got the idea on January 29th. And right before getting onto the seminar, I said, why did that idea pop into my head right then and there? So I went to our book, and I looked at what's happening on January 28th. And January 28th was the day that Judge Hoffman said that Ramsey Clark, the Attorney General of the United States, could not testify before the jury. I have to believe that was the tipping point. We had read about what's happening to Bobby Seale, which is outrageous. We had read about the exchanges. Because, I mean, what we did in this book, we had, it's almost like a joke book if we weren't so serious. Because the colloquies between Kunstler and the judge and the prosecutors were just unbelievable, totally unbelievable. I mean, Sorkin, I think, did a great job with the movie. I mean, he really caught the spirit of what happened. Uh, and, of course, transcripts read like, uh, well, scripts. Transcript really, really reads like a script. But we were, saw what was going on, and we said, this is outrageous. And our reaction was, more people have to know what's happening. We've got to get the word out. Somebody, we said, somebody ought to do a book about this. And then we made that big jump. Hey, why don't we do it? And that was the big jump from being outside, and then all of a sudden, hey, let's see what we can do, and let's be an active participant. So what we did, we got on the phone, and got to remember, this is the days before FedEx, before fax machines, even really before word processors. Mm. Processors. So we, and the trial. This was on. And say this was on January 29th. He had had the idea. We called up the court reporter, and the court reporters make their money. Generally, they keep the, what they do with the, for the work they do, and the court the lawyers all get daily transcript, which they charge at an exorbitant rate, and anything over that, over and above that, is profit. So we called the court reporter and said, "Hey, will you sell us a transcript?" She said, "Yes." So she agreed to ship us the first 15,000 pages for $900. I was a, just starting a job at a Wall Street law firm, and I borrowed it from one of my uh, women named Laura Hogay, who was a year ahead of me. Um, and again, I said, before FedEx, she had to get basically put the transcript. We had a little negotiation back and forth. But we had a, she put the transcript on a plane. And my co-editor, Danny Greenberg, who had just graduated Columbia Law School at the time, and was doing what we called, uh, euphemistically called, alternative service to the country, which means he was teaching in Harlem to avoid the draft, because he wasn't yet 26 and he would have been drafted, and I was a big concern about everybody. Danny had to go to the airport at 4.30 in the morning, and he got there on February 7th, 4.30 in the morning, and got the transcript off the, tra off the plane. He brought it back. We, I'd say it was 20, that was 15,000 pages. It ended up being 22,000 pages. We got a bunch of friends. Having been working in Wisconsin with my roommate, George McNamee, who graduated Yale the same year I graduated law school, we had worked in political campaigns. We understood how you set up a volunteer system. So we got 20 to 30 friends in our apartment, basically a one-bedroom apartment on East 83rd Street. And we distributed, we told them what we were looking for. We said, "This what's happening is incredible. We want you to read the transcript. And we gave up. Danny was one in charge of handing out keeping track of what was being given out. And we told them, take out whatever you think is unusual. We had a bunch of, we wanted the confrontations. We wanted to capture the outrage. We wanted to capture the humor. We wanted to capture the substance of the philosophies of both sides. So we told them, you know, anything out of the ordinary, give it. And the, the other big important thing we did with them is we said, don't, we were all definitely left of center because you know, we've been marching and everything else. Uh, we said, we want it to be fair. We want a down the middle pulling out of what's, what's, in, what's happening there. So they did through it, and we went through a funnel system, and I ended up reading virtually everything, making the final decisions. Uh, we added very little text. Just occasionally we'd say, now cross-examination of a witness. But it's basically excerpts, verbatim excerpts of the entire trial has the summation, has the introdu introductory statements by the lawyers. It has the summations to the end, and it has all the speeches that the defendants gave uh, at the trial when, after they were found guilty. 
Yeah, I thought that the summations at the end were really fascinating. And also the charge that the judge gave to the jury before they went into deliberations. Uh, you know, basically he forbade all uh, all of uh, the defendant's lawyers to essentially do the same thing, you know, give a philosophical overview about what this trial is about. And, and here he did it himself. Uh, and, and I think that was really fascinating. Let's talk a little bit about how the judge actually was in real life. I think the movie did a really good job. You know, in the transcript, you can see that he was actually way worse and way more mean than he was in the movie. But so what do you think uh, did the movie do right in capturing the way that he was as a human, as a judge, uh, and how much he enjoyed being basically unjust? Let me say this about the movie. I think it's an excellent movie. It fully captures the spirit of the trial and the spirit of the times. And I'm delighted it came out when it did because the situation we were in politically last year with Trump, I have a bias. My politics are not on the side of Trump. Uh, so releasing the movie when he did in the summer of protests, I thought it was really important. But I... The trouble, I have a lot of trouble with the, tri with the transcript. I mean, he did a brilliant job, Sorkin, but he took a lot of creative license, if you will. And the judge is a, is a good case in point. Um, by the way, the judge, Langella, who did a great job, good performance, but not at all like Judge Julius Hoffman. In the trial, Langella is a big, bulky, brutal guy who's dogmatic and yells a lot. Julius Hoffman was anything but. His law clerk called him a Mr. Magoo character. He was short. He was ancient. He was 75, which I say it's ancient. I'm now older than that, having graduated the college in 66. Um, but Langello was actually operating with a hammer, almost like Thor's hammer, and yelled a lot. Hoffman didn't do that. He was a thin-skinned, nasty, mean, malevolent person. And instead of using a big Thor's hammer, thousands of little pinpricks, sarcastic, all over the place. Um, the trial would have been totally different, totally different if there were a different judge. So that, that's, that's say, I think Sorkin did a good job. Um, what I liked what he did, his introductory scene of John Mitchell, I think was very successful in showing how petty the Nixon administration was. Now, a lot of problems with that scene. I mean, the reason why these people were picked on, all eight of them, and tried had nothing to do with uh, John Mitchell being annoyed that Ramsey Clark didn't resign at the end. And that opening, there was a meeting, by the way, it's interesting, there was a meeting in Washington with the, the prosecutor, Ferran, Prosecutor Schultz, and John Mitchell. But it was nothing at all like the movie. Um, for the first thing, well, by the way, the lead counsel in that trial was not Dick Schultz. It was Tom Foran. And Schultz was not a closet sympathizer with the defendants. In that opening scene at John Mitchell's office, they have him arguing against the prosecution at all. He said they're innocent, and he didn't want to do it. The truth is, Foran and Schultz went to Washington with a draft of the indictment. Schultz was not sympathetic at all. And that's one of the biggest problems I have with the, uh, with the movie. I heard an interesting podcast with Sorkin on Economist, uh, by a reporter from The Economist. And because I say the movie is, I think it's really great. It captures, it really captures the spirit of what was going on. And the reporter asked him, how do you justify all the differences? And I hope we'll, I hope we'll have time to get into some of the differences, because I think people are very interested in it, and I think they're very important. And Sorkin started talking about the differences between um, creative license and journalistic accuracy. Um, I mean, there's a great quote. I think uh, Camus says that uh, fiction is the lie through which we tell the truth. And I do not deny that fiction frequently can tell the truth a lot more than what actually happened. My biggest problem with Sorkin here is he's not working with fiction. 
I mean, I was not a history major, I was a government major at Columbia. Uh, there were some great history professors there, Hofstad, Richard Hofstadter, uh, James Shenton, Walter Metzger, I had a great class in constitutional history with him. Um, so my co my co-editor, Danny Greenberg from Columbia Law School, who's was president of the Legal Aid Society here for 10 years, he thinks it doesn't make a difference. He thinks the movie showed people what happened there, and it was worth it, and it was good, and what are we worrying about? The facts. I think the facts are really important because I understand if you're doing Moby Dick, if you're doing Gone with the Wind, you have to take a lot of invention and make things work. And it's always difficult to squeeze things into two hours. But Sorkin saying that it's a question of journalistic accuracy against the truth, he did go on to say later, the end, well, if I had a little more time, I might have, I probably could have done it a little more truthfully. And interestingly, there is a very good movie which has straight more transcript and more the reality of the trial uh, by Jeremy Kagan called Conspiracy, the Trial of the Chicago Eight. I think it's available on Amazon Prime. But the other good things that the liberties that Sorkin took, which I thought were really good and helped make the movie much better, well, very, very good one, was the cross-examination scenes, particularly those with Abby Hoffman. Those were brilliant. You know, I've never been on trial for my thoughts before. Um, yeah, my that was contempt. very good. And, and, and talking about contempt of the government for him, not in the cross-examination. Abby did take the stand. Abby was one of the two people. He and Rennie Davis took the stand. But what Sorkin did was take the very eloquent closing statement by Abby Hoffman. And again, another, another thing in the movie, and this would be a spoiler alert, but I'm assuming most people have seen it. The ending is totally fake. The way the trial ended... In the movie, it's very triumphant. The judge is standing there banging the gavel, uh, and he's, Hayden is reading the names of the American war dead. The reality was the trial was a lot more about the American war dead. We were all very upset about the American war dead. But a lot of us didn't want to go to Vietnam, not because we were afraid of being killed. We did not want to kill. So Hayden did not give a speech at the end that stopped the trial, nor did he read the names. There was a portion earlier when David Dellinger on October 15th did start the day right before trial began by read, trying to read the names of dead, but the Vietnamese and American war dead. And he didn't get very far, the judge prohibited it. Um, but let's say the total was, the, the, the trial just ended, the, you know, the trial did not end triumphantly, the trial ended with Bobby Seale back in jail, because his, tri when his trial had been, his case had, had been a mistrial, and the other seven defendants going off to jail. They had been in jail, Dave Dellinger had been in jail since February 4th. By the way, it's almost a defamation of what the movie did with Dave Dellinger. Dave Dellinger never hit anybody in his life. But his daughters were hit in the courtroom. <laughs> his daughters were hit in the courtroom by the marshals, which was not in the movie. And I think that would have been maybe really good, right? If they had shown that the well, marshals hit his two daughters. Absolutely. I mean, and you're right. And it was a daughter. The movie had it as a boy. But that's a, that's yes. a piddling difference. Uh, but they did or not. <laughs> was a conscientious objector in World War II. He refused to register for the draft. This guy, a Yale graduate, he refused to register for the draft. He was tossed into jail. Uh, when he was finally drafted, he refused to serve, tossed in jail again. He was a pacifist and continued till his death, protesting. He was in Japan, I think, when he was 90, protesting against the nuclear plant there. So, but, but what Sorkin did really well, I thought, was as I say, setting up how awful the government, the Nixon administration was by showing how Mitchell was. It... Um, taking some of the dialogue from the speeches, because at the end of the trial, every defendant gave his own speech. In fact, they were allowed to talk twice. After they were sentenced to contempt on February 14th and 15th, each of them was allowed to speak. And then after they were found guilty on the 20th, each of them were allowed to speak. And these are, we have excerpts from these in the, in the, uh, in the in book. The, in the and book, they're, they're fantastic. The other brilliant thing I think that Sorkin did, because as I say, transcripts, 22,000 pages can be really boring, particularly when they're describing facts. By using actual footage of cops clobbering 
civilians, people protesting. You know, a lot of the black, all of the black and white footage was real footage. And then he had some uh, footage with, with actors. Yes. That brought it to life in the way nothing in any book could do. It was brilliant. And it really brought it home. But as I say, my, my problems with the transcript, because I think truth is important. I'm not trying to say, and it's actually very important, obviously, what's been going on in the last couple of years uh, with uh, Trump and his followers having their own alternate set of facts. But is it okay if I just mention some other places where the uh, trial, with, where the movie went uh, astray in terms of the, the facts of what happened? Sure, you could do that. But we have time I, for that? I, well, we have only like another nine minutes, and I wanted to ask you about what you think was a positive thing that came out of the trial. You know, at the time, even though they went to jail, it wasn't like it had no effect on the country. What was the mood after it ended at that time? Well, the, the mood after it, it was really one part. Remember, the trial wasn't just about the war. The significance of this trial was the government trying to repress dissent and trying to repress protest. And that had happened a couple of times before the trial. Um, William Sloan Coffin, who was a chaplain at Yale, and uh, Dr. Benjamin Spock, who wrote a book that 13 million parents used to raise their kids, they were put in jail for uh, burning draft records. Father Dan Berrigan and his brother Phil Berrigan and seven other Catholics, I mean, Father Dan and Father uh, Phil were, Je were Jesuits. They poured napalm on draft records. That was called the trial of the Catonsville Nine. So what this happened, it was really showing that the corruption even extended to the judicial system. Everybody knew that Nixon and Agnew were mean, nasty people. And everybody found out about it later, you know, when 72 came about, uh, and the Watergate break-in, that Nixon and John Mitchell, attorney general of the country, was in on the meetings of how do we break into the headquarters of the Democratic Party? That was who was running the country. And so this really showed the whole justice system. I mean, and it's not surprising for state court judges not to be very top-notch, but generally federal judges really are good. Uh, I'm not sure we can say that for a long time, uh, given what some of the non-approved people who were not really approved, uh, but who were ratified by the Senate last year. Um, so that, that's really what happened. It really, I think, the trial itself didn't make a big impact, but the whole anti-war movement made a big impact. I mean, the same year as the trial was going on, the trial only had, the demonstration in Chicago only had, what, 10,000 people? But while the trial was going on on October 15th, the day that Dave Dellinger was reading the names of the Vietnamese, tried to read the names of the Vietnamese, 500,000 people were demonstrating in Washington. A month later, November 15th, another 500,000. And my, you know, I and my friends were there demonstrating in Washington. So there was a big movement of going on. Uh, and, and that's what happened. It really woke up the country. Uh, and, I, and I think our book had a significant part of it. We, we sold something like 180,000 copies. Wow. And I say we, they, they, were able, yeah, they were able to get the book in the bookstores literally 10 days after the trial ended. Um, That's tremendous. Well, at the end, uh, you know, the statement by Jay Rubin, he said to Judge Hoffman that he is actually radicalizing a lot of young people through the trial, uh, you know, with the outcome. So it sounds like that's essentially accurate with, in aggregate, millions I of people it protesting. It, it did. It, 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 act, it, it really stirred up the base. The activism it continued. I mean, it, it was very much like what happened last summer with the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah. So, what do you People think are the parallels to... between that time, the late '60s, and to and last year? In what ways do you think they're the same? In what ways are they different? Well, in both cases, the situation that produced them was the same. You had a corrupt president, in my opinion, whether it was Richard Nixon or uh, Donald Trump. You had a Justice Department, John Mitchell, or William Barr, who basically spun the Mueller report in a way that is still being litigated. Um, so that situation 
was there. The effect of the media, I think, was very important with all the demonstrations, because not just our book and the trial, but the newspapers and TV. I mean, I remember, you know, Infernal Hall, where I was <laughs> during the 60s uh, when I was there. I mean, what, people would watch TV, and they, we'd see the bombing in Vietnam. We'd see the napalm. Napalm being a, you know, it was dropped from the air, and it would just burn people alive. Um, so there was all the outrage. Um, the energy is the same. And the other thing that's interesting in terms of the same, I think the size of the demonstrations. And unfortunately, unfortunately, I think what is the same is the reaction by the authorities, whether it's by Richard Daly or John Mitchell or Donald Trump telling people, cart them out of here, you know, the way we used to do it. Uh, and the cops. Chicago banging heads. Um, I mean, it's interesting what's happened, all the, all the racial protests that Eugene Robinson, a great reporter for the Washington Post, said uh, after one of the first videos, iPhone videos came out uh, of a black person basically being assassinated by the cops, just the way Fred Hampton was, if you will. Um, that now, will you believe us? Because this is going on all the time, but until we had the pictures no, we believed it. So the activism was the same. I think nowadays, I think two differences in the, I think maybe you have more older people joining in the, in the activist demonstrations now. And I suspect that's because of all of us baby boomers have grown up and we're protesting where our parents back then were not protesting. I think the other big difference is um, a lot of the demonstrations against the war were very heavily white. The civil rights demonstrations were heavily black with a, lot of, with a number of white people. What was very inspiring and encouraging about the demonstrations of last summer, where I think you had whites and blacks marching together. And that was pretty big. My, one of the things I'm concerned about what's being picked up with the demonstrations, and I think this is yet to be seen, is I'm afraid some of the demonstrators on January 6th may be taking some lessons about demonstrating, and that's not good. Well, I would say that the demonstrators from January 6th are very different than the demonstrators of Black Lives Matter. First of all, I think they're different. They have different goals. And uh, they are different kinds of people. <laughs> I think they're primarily white who came on January 6th. I fully agree with you. But what we have to understand, and if we're ever going to solve the problem in this country, and I'm not sure he could, they believed as strongly in their cause as we believed in ours. So... They saw some effect demonstrations being effective. Now, I mean, I know, I mean, I, I want these guys, I mean, it's interesting. All of a sudden, my generation is in favor of the FBI. We're in favor of generals uh, during the Trump administration. We, we, you know, the, the people were rooting for the FBI. I mean, it, hard to believe. But I think we have to realize that uh, both sides are very sincere in their beliefs, no matter how wrong they are. And I mean, what's disappointing to me is I'm beginning to get a little afraid that some of the momentum of the Black Lives Matter movement may be fading the same way a lot of our, you know, we've been in Afghanistan for how long? So 20 years. We got out of, we got out of Vietnam, ultimately, 1974, uh, we finally got out. And that's, by the way, you know, four years after the trial ended. So it's, it, the, the parallels are there. And the hope is there now. I have a lot of hope in the sense from what happened with the Black Lives Matter movement. Yeah, let's talk about uh, that. But I'm, what, let's talk about what you're hopeful about looking into the future. What makes you hopeful? Not a lot. Not a lot at all. I, I don't have a lot of hope. I'm, I'm sort of, I'm worried for my nieces and nephews, my great nieces and nephews. Uh, I dedicated to the book, I think, to my grand, great nieces and nephews in the hope that their generation will succeed where my generation fell short. I think we have a lot of big problems, not just politically. Um, I think climate change is an obvious one, but the other problems I think are uh, CRISPR, the technique for splicing genes. We can have design of babies. I mean, you may be able to get a whole military force of Trumpites. Uh, technology that we can be traced anywhere, like the ending of uh, Atwood's uh, Handmaid's Tale. You know, you use a credit card and they know where you are. I'm, I'm not a Luddite, but the technology, I mean, what happened in the colonial pipeline? 
let two weeks ago. It's very upsetting because nuclear plants, everything is all in one connected grid. You're not going to have to make a phone call as it happened in Belarus for the thing, hey, there's a bomb on board, take this dissident down. The hackers, any systems can be disrupted so easily. And, um, and aging, I think, you know, uh, we're prolonging life in, in this country, not in every country, obviously, but, uh, you know, the, the result, I mean, a number of people I know who are getting dementia and they're drooling, it's very, very sad. So I, I'm not particularly hopeful. I'm, I'm hopeful, I think, you know, people like Greta Thurberg and the young kids who are getting involved in climate change, that gives me hope, but I see the hopes that we had in the, in the 60s and the 70s, and we thought we changed a lot of things, and we didn't. I mean, the un love unintended consequence is incredible. Uh, we thought we were great by getting rid of the draft. We really did it. We got rid of that draft. So what's the result? We got 20 years in Afghanistan with people who are being drafted, none of them college students, none of them sons of Congress, virtually none, of congressmen or presidents or vice presidents. So they have no incentive. The war is not brought home to them. So I'm, I'm really not a happy camper. Hmm. Yes, I think the way that we recruit now for people to go to war is um, deeply disassociated from who we are as people, as everyday people, because you can just cut out a piece and let other people do it. So um, here's my last question before we move on to the Q&A from the audience, uh, and that is, what is your deepest wish for people after they've either read your transcript that you've so carefully edited in 1968, 69, and or have seen the movie? What do you want people to take away? Get involved. Get involved. To march. I mean, I was really not going anywhere with COVID. I was in my house totally, 24-7. However, I, on Thanksgiving, I went down to 10 days to Georgia wearing my double mask and a visor on the plane. And I went down there and I worked for Stacey, but not for Stacey, for Ossoff and, and the Rev, Reverend Warnock, for 10 days trying to register voters down there. I think that's what we need to do. I want people to get involved and involved and to also, I think we have to start being open to talk to friends and talk to our enemies as well. I don't like it, but Alyssa Slotkin, who's a very good, New con congressional representative in the Went to Trump Park. district. Yes, that's right. She did, uh, and she's one of this progressive caucus. And her advice to people, because I was on a Zoom with her two weeks ago, she says, "Talk with people, not about what's going on. Go to the food pantries and work alongside them. Get to know people as people. Don't discuss politics. We have to realize that we're all human beings." Uh, and then maybe, maybe, maybe something will change. Because I think when, when we start treating people as individuals, maybe then there's hope. Yes, I agree. We should treat people as individuals. And remember, we're all human together and we're all suffering this condition at the same time. Um, so let me see. Here's the first question from Thomas Brunner. He says, did you have any contact with the lawyers on either side as you were preparing for the book? Were they aware of what you were doing? Uh, no. However, we did call, I mean, right now, I mean, Danny has done a lot of work over the last 30 years with Bill Kunstler and, uh, and Lenny Weinglass. However, I do remember a phone call we made to Bill Kunstler's house because we had some question about something in the transcript and we were really reluctant to make the phone call because he had just been sentenced to, I forget how many years of contempt, you know, in jail for contempt. Uh, so we did not have contact with them. Interestingly, right after, with the people who were doing the appeals, they came to us and said, can we use your copy of the transcript? And we said, absolutely. So the, the, for the appellate lawyers, we provided, our, we, we provided our, uh, our transcript and everything we had on it. And we've had contract, you know, we had, Conversation with them subsequently, but not not during the trial. They they were up to their up to their neck doing what they were doing. Right, and plus the judge removed some of their lawyers who were helping them in the middle of the trial, or not the judge, some the marshals caught them. But uh... the judge tossed in jail before the trial even started on the very on December twenty fourth. He took four junior lawyers who were part of the defense team, right. who were only involved in doing pre-trial preparations. When they try to step out from the case, which would be very normal, 
Judge Hoffman cited them for contempt, tossed the two that were in Chicago in jail, ordered the others to come to, to, come to Chicago so he can put them in jail. 100 lawyers, next, uh, over the weekend, 100 lawyers went down to the courthouse and marched and got into the courthouse and talked to everybody. Harvard petitioned, Harvard lawyers wrote letters. Julius had to back down. But that started the whole thing, the way, the way Hoffman treated the uh, treated everybody. Treated the defense, yes. Here, Because you know, yeah, it was Judge Hoffman and, and Abby Hoffman, and, and, and they really represented the clash of cultures that existed, because that's what it was. The whole trial was a clash of cultures. It was the establishment personified by Julie and the counterculture personified by Abby. Yes. Well, here is another question from Annie Della Pietra. She's class of 91. She wants to know, was Bobby Seale really gagged and bound in the courtroom, or was that creative license as well? It's true. Great question. <laughs> it, it's not only true, and now, obviously, you know, d during the convention, during the demonstrations, when the cops were clubbing everybody, people were yelling, because cameras were all over the place, the whole world is watching, the whole world is watching. Well, during that trial, the whole world is watching. But the problem I have with that Bobby Seale scene, and her question of asking whether it really happened is an important one, because Bobby Seale, you know, the trial has Dick Schultz for putting on another witness. He's a nice guy, and he goes up, Judge, we got to get rid of this. We got to let him free. We got to have a mistrial. Bullshit, part of my language. He never did anything like this. Bobby Seale, a black man, was gagged and chained in an American courtroom for four days. Four days. And that is missed. And why? And he didn't do it because he was not tossed in jail because Fred Hampton was killed the night before. That's another artistic license, if you will, by Sorkin. Bobby Seale was severed from the trial on November 5th. Fred Hampton was assassinated 30 days later on December 4th. Bobby Seale was tossed in jail because he was a black man asking for his rights to defend himself. And the triggering moment was he made a comment when Judge Julius is pushing him. Bobby says, look at those guys on the wall. He had, J Julius Hoffman had paintings of, I think, Ben Franklin and George Washington. They're slave owners. Slave owners, never, horrible, never in my life have I been, as Julia is saying, have I had to hear somebody say that the father of this country were slave owners. Um, I mean, Julius couldn't deal with it. And then a line that Sorkin, Sorkin did take verbatim from the transcript. And it's so chilling. And it's in our book on page 74. And let me just, let me just read it very briefly. He did say verbatim, Take that defendant into the room in there and deal with him as he should be dealt with in the circumstance. And four days, and every day, because Bobby sometimes could mutter be under the chains, they made the gags tighter. They made the chains more. The last couple of days, there was not just a gag around his mouth. They took a gag under his chin, over his head, put a knot in it, and made it really tight. And Bobby says, my head, I, it was something. It was something. So I appreciate the question, it didn't happen. And it's important it did. Uh, but it happened for four days. Four days is totally different than the few hours that we saw in the movie. I have a question about the judge, as you said, you know, this is the counterculture against the establishment. But, uh, you know, I think one of the things that's lost is that actually Judge Hoffman was born in 1895. Uh, which you shared with me in our pre-call. And it's the kind of thing where when you see this movie, that's not what you're thinking. I mean, he has this perception of himself in a way that's completely at odds with the way people were at the time. And as you mentioned, you're even older than he was at that time. But I think it's so different the way that, you know, he li he was born in 1895, so he lived through World War One, lived through World War Two, And I think to come to this courtroom... Uh, in his defense, it must have been totally jarring to see these people um, and, and try to defend their rights to protest. You're right, but he didn't care about their rights to protest. He was upset that they appeared in the courtroom in blue jeans. They were, he was upset that people, they didn't have jacket and ties on. He was upset that they were reading the newspaper. He was upset that they laughed. Oh, yes, he was a lot so of that. Sensitive. There's so many references. I've never had this 
disrespect in this court. They're laughing at me. They're not laughing at your honor. There's something funny. I know when they're laughing at me. I'm not getting any respect. I've never been treated like this. The appellate court in overruling and reversing the convictions on the charge that they were convicted of, of crossing state lines, to, uh, intent, not for, they were found innocent of the conspiracy charge. But the Court of Appeals cited 150, 150 instances of Judge Hoffman's statements that provoked the defendants and provoked the lawyers. And they said, if nothing else happened, we would reverse, and there were a lot of legal errors, enormous number of legal errors. But he said, if nothing else happened, the conduct of the judge and the conduct of the prosecutors would be enough to reverse the verdict. They made disparaging comments about the defendants and the lawyers and their cases in front of the jury. So Hoffman was out of the league. Uh, he was of a different generation. He was 75, virtually, except for Dave Dellinger, all the defendants, roughly 30, between 28 and 33. It was totally different world, and he couldn't understand it. And he considered himself a good guy. He was upset. Nobody's ever said that I don't like blacks. He almost said, none of the context, you know, some of my best friends are. Uh, he couldn't deal with somebody saying, you don't understand and you're not a liberal, because he considered himself a liberal, but he's a liberal in terms of 1932 when FDR was elected. And that was a long, long time ago before the trial. Yeah, it was. Well, one question that I had in this context, you know, uh, everything that you're saying here, that this, this could have all been reversed, uh, how is it that the jury ended up convicting them? Because when you read the transcript, and even when you see the movie, it seems inconceivable that they would. Two, two or three reasons. One is the jury was not a jury of their peers. This is another reason why the judge, why the Seventh Circuit Appellate Court reversed the conviction. Um, usually when, when judges, when, when, a, when jurors are chosen, and they're chosen by lawyers in the state court, by federal judges in the federal court, but based on questions uh, provided by the lawyers, the judge basically asked, what's your name, what's your address? And the only substantive question he asked really was, do you or any member of your family work for law enforcement or any other agency? That was it. The judge, the, the court cited the times of questions that the defendant's lawyers asked, he, he asked. They said they should have asked him, how do you feel about protest? Julie refused to do it. How do you, re, how do you feel about people who have long hair? How do you have, feel about people who have other views? All these questions, which are typical to be and appropriate to be asked, in order to weed out jurors, Hoffman refused. So it was not a jury of the peers. That, that's one thing. The other thing, which is very interesting, and this came out two months after the trial and it's part of the appeal, is also the jury was sequestered and they wanted to get out of there, but there were communications between Judge Hoffman and the jurors by way of the one of the court marshals, which the contrary to established policy, the lawyers were never told about. Normally, if the jury has some question, we want to see additional wit, we want to see additional testimony, which they asked for, um, or we, as they reported, we can't reach a verdict. We can't reach a verdict. What should we do? Normally, go to open court, and the judge calls lawyers from both sides and they say, this is what's going on, and they discuss what should be done. Not at all. Julie just sent back, go at it. We want a decision. And the bailiffs are reported to have said, hey, look, it's a long trial. You want to get out of here? Come up with a verdict. So that's really how it happened. And interestingly, one of the jurors that was replaced, and that part of the movie is true, uh, one, there were two sympathetic jurors, uh, and in the trial, both were kicked off the trial. Uh, jury. In, in real life, only one was. Uh, the other one stayed on. But one of the substitute jurors was the one who brokered the deal. But again, they were, it was an alternate who was chosen. Mm -hmm. uh, it was clearly a compromise uh, verdict because uh, they wanted to get out of there. They'd been sequestered. And again, this was something they lawyers did not want to happen, the defendants not want to happen. These people wanted to get home. They were in, couldn't see their families for four and a half months. Yes, they just wanted it to be over. So here is a question from Patricia Hewitt. She's SIA class of 71. Uh, she wants to know, can you tell us something about what has happened to the defendants since the trial ended, including Bobby Seale? Bobby is very interesting. Uh, I mean, Bobby should never have been in, I mean, he was correct. He should never have been in that trial in the first place. He was in and out 
before I was making a, making a speech. And by the way, the judge refusing to um, judge refusing to allow him to have his lawyers was another reason why the court uh, reversed the decision. They said Hoffman was wrong. He should have had a hearing to see if he was entitled to his to his jury. But the, the Panthers. The image of Panthers, which the government was trying to say, of people with guns and trying to uh, create riots. The Panthers program was really a breakfast program. They were trying to bring breakfast to underprivileged communities. And what Bobby Seale is doing now, he's going around the country, speaking on college campuses, urging people to run for office, urging people to get involved in local elections. Um, Abby remained active. Unfortunately, he was a manic depressive and ended up dying by suicide, but he stayed true. Dave Dellinger stayed true. Uh, Jerry Rubin went totally corporate. He, he started having network parties uh, so people could meet each other and exchange cards. And he, he wrote some book about his sexual abilities. Uh, it was just, he was not saying, he cut his hair. I mean, just he went to work for a Wall Street brokerage firm. He just was not the same person. Uh, Tom Hayden was interesting. I mean, there was a movie you know, I mentioned, I think, the movie almost defamed certain people, like Bill Kunstler. Bill knew about political trials. He didn't have to be convinced. He'd been doing them for years. Um, Tom Hayden comes off in the movie in this conflict that Sorkin sets up between uh, Abby and Tom. Tom says, you know, we're not going to win elections. Boy, that is not Tom Hayden of 1979 or 1969 and 1970. Tom Hayden's you know, drafted this port urine statement. He believed in demonstrations. Later in life, he be, and, and after after the trial, he and his then wife Jane Fonda traveled around the country, uh, organizing rallies with musicians and against the war, because the war had been expanded. Or been expanded without the Congress being told, without the American people being told. We had gone in and bombed other countries, and we were lied to um, by Nixon. So. He was continuing in the right cause. He ultimately did get into the traditional politics, and he became a state. Uh, he became a state uh, legislator. Uh, and Sorkin, I think one of the movies has this whole twist on it. Is uh, when Sorkin wrote the movie, he had a long conversation with uh, with Tom before his death, and I think that sort of allowed because there were differences, but it was nothing, nothing really as uh, dynamic as uh, as that. Rennie Davis uh, just uh, just died very recently, a couple of months ago. Um, Freunds and Weiner went doing their normal lives. So those, as the movie points out, those are add-ons. They were they allowed the jury to let somebody, somebody uh, free. Um. So I have a question about Foran and Schultz. What happened to them? Because, like you said, you know, in the it's very clear in the transcript that the kind of humanity that it was humanity that was assigned to Schultz in the movie was non-existent in real life. But how did they? Um, continue their years with the Justice Department? Well, Tom Foran, Foran thought he would uh, be governor. And he saw this trial as a great way to get himself the publicity to be reelected, to be elected. It didn't happen. Uh, he made some homophobic remarks, and, and he was just made a fool of uh, uh, in the movie. Uh, Schultz. It was interesting. I was to it was totally, and we. Had, I say the original book was published, fifty, you know, in 1970, right after the trial, and this is the 50th anniversary edition. We added two appendices, uh, which were not in the original edition. One is about the post-trial lives of all the defendants, the lawyers, and the judge, um, and another is about um, what happened in all the various appeals. But Schultz was one I couldn't find anything online about him. Absolutely nothing. I was finally able to find some small references to somebody once worked with, and I was able to network to him. And I spoke to him on the phone, and he is one bitter man. One bitter man. Uh, he thinks there's no good work to save a counselor. Um, he, he, you know, getting him to speak to me was difficult. He, fi he finally did. I think he was encouraged by his wife. But, um, and, and Rennie and, uh, not Rennie, uh, Bill and Lenny stayed true. They kept litigating. Uh, Bill represented the Central Park Five, uh, now called the Exonerated Five. Uh, he died actually before the verdict was reversed. 
Uh, Lenny represented uh, Daniel, Daniel Ellsberg's co-defendant in the uh, Pentagon Papers case. So both of them, as you, as, you know, as, as we point out in the appendix, they stayed very, very true to what was uh, going on. And Dave Dellinger was, you know, protesting and virtually until his death. Well, it's good to hear that basically most of them stayed true of whatever their roles were in the beginning um, <laughs> on both sides, sure. and, you know. And, yeah, I mean, for a while, Rennie got involved with some New Age stuff. Uh, it was, I think it was in the mid '70s, and it was hard to figure out. He became an acolyte of uh, some guru from uh, India, uh, and was raising funds mm -hmm. for him. And that, that perplexed a lot of his friends, and ultimately, he set up a foundation trying to change the way people think in terms of on a more holistic basis to try to change things called the Foundation for a New, a, a new Humanity. Um, but J Jerry was the one who just nobody could, could figure out. Uh, I mean, he set up pyramid schemes. Bobby Seale was interesting. In addition to um, lecturing around the country, he wrote a couple of books. One, of course, was a barbecue book with a reference to uh, barbecuing bacon, which was... Uh, as you see like the, the pigs book, a lot of in the book, lots of references to pigs <laughs> in the book. Bobby also taught uh, at Temple University in um, in Philadelphia. At one time, also, I would say he was also trying to sell some wonder drug uh, that Jerry Rubin was hawking in some sort of Amway scheme. Uh, what can I tell? You? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, we all we all like the magic the magic pills. So uh, here's the last question, again, from Thomas Brunner. Uh, he wants to know, was there any effort during the trial to seek intervention of the Seventh Circuit of Appeals? Not to my knowledge, Tom. Tom, by the way, is a classmate of mine from uh, Columbia 66. Uh, to my knowledge, not, 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 not at all. Um, the, I believe there may have been some motions early on when the, when the, uh, when Hoffman was jailing the four young lawyers at the beginning, I think there were some motions to the Seventh Circuit. But to my knowledge, there were no other uh, motions until the end. And I'd say they were, they were in five cases afterwards because there were, there were five separate post-trial cases. And on our website, which is uh, chicago7trial.com, I have a page called Related Links, and we give links to each of the court decisions in the five cases. There was one, the appeal of Bobby Seale's 16 contempt, contempts, which were thrown out. By the way, you know, there were 175 contempts in this case, contempt convictions, 159 against the seven people, another 16 against Bobby Seale, 175. At the end of the day, after going up and down and up and down the courts, only 13 were upheld. The courts, appellate courts basically said that, you know, a lot of the stuff was provocation. And the only ones that were upheld were... Uh, seven against Dave Dillinger, two against Bill Kunstler, and two each against Abby and Jerry. Interestingly, the ones against Abby and Jerry are for something that happened in the movie, uh, for wearing judicial robes. But again, it was not in the early part of the trial. It was really on a couple of days from the end um, that that occurred. Let me point out one other thing that happened in the movie. It was very different. Ramsey Clark, the court, appellate court said he should have been allowed to testify. Absolutely. Bill Kunstler, and you, you see Bill's argument in the book, Bill's argument that he should be allowed to testify, and they, re they said that was also a reversible error. But even in the voir dire, I mean, so it's very good. Sorkin is trying to say how right our guys, how right the defendants were, because he has Ramsey saying, hey, his department had determined that it was a police riot and there was no conspiracy. But he never said that. Even in the voir dire, outside of the, outside of the jury, Ramsey Clark's testimony, neither of those things, neither of those things did he say. Yeah, well, I I still really enjoyed. I mean, to your point, it was still an incredibly, really good movie, and it was really fantastic for especially younger people like myself who weren't alive in 1968 to see it and to know that these things happened and and to be able to draw the parallels to what's happening today. You're right. One of the reasons we did the book was we wanted people to know about the trial. We wanted people to know about the outrages that were happening. And people forgot it. So Sorkin has done a great service by bringing out the movie, because let me tell you, a lot more people know about what happened 
in terms of the spirit of what happened and the substance of what happened, even though there's so many differences, uh, because Sorkin did this movie. And again, it's not really Sorkin. He's getting all the credit. Sorkin didn't, he wrote an introduction to our book where Sorkin says, Steven Spielberg was the idea for Steven Spielberg, who was originally going to direct the movie. And he called him in 2006 when they were originally going to do this. And Spielberg wanted Sorkin to write the screenplay. And he, Sorkin says, Stephen called me in and I went over because I was really excited. And he told me he'd want me to write the script. And I said, great idea, Stephen. I'd love to do this. It's going to be a great movie. Sorkin then says, he left Steven Spielberg's house, called his dad and said, what's the Chicago 7? He had no idea. He was born in 1961. Uh, so a lot of the credit, much as I think Sorkin did a great job, but a lot of credit also is due, is due to Stephen uh, Steven Spielberg. By the way, if anybody has questions here, which are not answered in the chat, uh, feel free to write me at mark, M-A-R-K, at uh, Chicago, chicago7trial.com, and I'll be glad to uh, answer your questions. Terrific. Well, thank you very much, Mark. Uh, this was really a fantastic evening. Thank you for sharing your evening with us and uh, your unique perspective on all the work that you did to bring the transcript to life and to fruition to all of us to, and to um, hear from you this evening on all of this. Thank you very much. So this concludes this evening's event. You're welcome. Uh, this concludes this evening's event, the trial of the Chicago 7 Talkback. Thanks so much for joining us. And as you log off, uh, I encourage you to take tonight's conversations with you as a reminder to stay inspired, to get involved, to Mark's point, to keep learning, to push the boundaries and to always remain fiercely committed to the common good. After all, that is what it means to be a Columbia Lion. We hope to see more of you at Reunion 2021 programs this week and next week. Enjoy your evening. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.